62. The title of the message is Trust in Him. How much are you and I going to trust God in 2024? If you were to live a life of trusting God, how would that be as you move in to 2024 tomorrow? Okay? And you would probably say, well, Pastor, of course I do. After all, I have a fish on my bumper sticker on my car. I live in America. I'm an American. I go to church on Sunday, and I mean, you know, after all, I mean, think about it for just a minute. You know, and that would be the answer to a lot of people that really think they're living a life of trust. But it's a whole lot more than that. People live a life of trust, but yet, uh, uh, but you find out most of the time they're still doing everything their way and their plans and their going and their doing, but yet at the same time they claim that they trust God. And usually when something happens and goes wrong, then we really start thinking about it or not. But often uh, the depth of our trust is not revealed until challenges come into our lives. It, it's during the challenging times that the level of our trust is really revealed. And so I want to look at trust in Him. Tonight it will be simply trust Him out of another psalm to try to help us challenge us as we move into 2024 because we're going to face challenges we've never faced before in our country. It's going to be the election year. You know, everything's coming up. Everything's going down the pike. And as I was telling the Sunday school class, if all what we're hearing from, I don't care if it's from the liberals, the conservatives, the Christians, whatever, if just half of what they say is coming they're going to do, we're going to need to trust God more than ever before. I mean, it seriously is. And I don't mean just say it. Or try, I'm saying doing it. Well, I trust God, but yet I got my plans. I trust God, and, and, but I'm going to do it my way, and I'm going to do it this way and that way, and Yet we still, you know, because as believers, we all at least trust God to some degree. Amen. Well, we're going to take a look at our brother David here. The background of this is you've got to understand, David, of course, as the kingdom is in, has been going really great and good for David at the time. But now all of a sudden there's a revolt that's coming up against the kingdom. And of all people, it's being headed up in, by his son, Absalom. Y'all with me? David's own son is leading a revolt against the kingdom to take his father out and to overthrow the kingdom. Now you can imagine what's going on in David's mind. I mean, my own flesh and blood, my own seed, my own son that I have raised in the palace and brought up and now is leading a revolt and an army against me to take the kingdom, to overthrow the throne. So you can imagine the, the, the heartache as a father. You can imagine the hurt as a father. If you've invested all those years uh, in, as a boy growing up and, and brought him in from your own loins, and now he wants to totally destroy the kingdom and overthrow the kingdom and take it over. So you can imagine and, and lead an army against him. And so that's how this psalm came about, 62 here. But if you look in Samuel 16, 11 through 13, uh, we, we find a, a little bit more of the story about it. As David said to Abishai and unto all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. He's talking about Absalom here. How much more now uh, may this Benjamite do it? Let me alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will requite me a good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei there went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. Could you imagine this is what's going on? So as a result of it, the Spirit of God leads David to write this Psalm 62. Maybe your Psalm today, I want it to be an encouragement to you and a lifting up to you because I don't know what struggles you're going through today, what battles you're facing, what's come upon you, your family, finances, health, sickness, whatever that you're facing, uh, business, everything, just uh, the kids, your family. I mean, folks, there's a lot of people in here that are going through a lot. A lot. 
And, and, and there's going to be a lot more coming. There, there's, there's health issues here. There's financial issues here. There's loneliness here. There, I mean, there's all kinds of things. And uh, people sometimes feel deserted, and especially this time of year. We haven't seen some because they've just recently lost a mate. And this is their first Christmas in season without their other mate. And you just you don't know what people are facing. And, and sometimes people wonder, God, are you there? Or where are you? And sometimes we trust the Lord, and then because God hasn't answered or moved so quickly, that trust begins to fade, and then we try to figure it out on our own. And we're going to try to resolve it on our own. And that's when we get in trouble. And yet we, sometimes we fail to trust the Lord. And I'll tell you, it, the scary times are coming. But David sits down under the Holy Spirit, and he pens this beautiful psalm. He starts off, follow along with me if you would. He said, truly my soul waiteth upon God. You need to wait on God today. From him cometh my salvation. Now remember what David's going through and what's happening. He just said that there in Samuel, we have it recorded of what's happening, what's, uh, what Absalom is trying to do to him. He says, he only is my rock, my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. You need to plant your feet in your heart today in the absolute, full, complete trust of God and be as David says, and I shall not be moved. He says, how long will ye imagine mischief against me? He's asking the Lord, how long are you going to allow all this trouble and mischief against me? Ye shall be slain, all of you. They only consult to cast me down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. That means pause and think on that a moment. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. What are you expecting from the Lord in 2024? I hope you have some expectations. He only is my rock, my salvation. He's my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, my rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Here's our title of our message. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Well, if we're going to trust in Him in 2024, as we see here in the life of David, we see that David had a constant trust. David had made a choice in his life. Look at verse 1. Truly my soul waiteth upon God, he says. From him cometh my salvation. David made a choice of constant trust. And he made that choice in times in which we live. He trusted at all times. You're going to have to trust God at all times in 2024. There's got to be a trust. The word trust here, let me give you the, to help you out with The word trust means to place confidence in, to behold or secure in. So in 2024, church, we're going to have to have a constant trust, and it's got to be the one at all times. You see, we need to place our confidence in Him. We need to behold her. We need to make sure that our, our, we're secure in Him. Faith is an abiding duty and a perpetual privilege. But David had this wonderful constant trust in the Lord. We've got to be constant in our trust in the Lord. We can't be in and out, in and out, in and out. It's got to be constant. And it's got to be at all times, not in the good times, not in the mountain times. But folks, let me tell you, there's going to be valley times this 2024 coming. There's going to be some sad times. There's going to be some rough times. There's going to be some times that you and I are going to be like David. We're going to have to cry out unto the Lord. And if God says, let go of the branch, then what are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to respond back as the guy did in a joke and say, is anybody else up there? He asked God for help. And God said, not a problem. I've got this. Let go of the branch. Uh, we got another plan here. Another option? No. God says, let go of the branch. There may be some times we're facing, we're going to have to let go. And we're going to have to trust God completely. 
in our lives, in the life of our church, our family, whatever. But it's got to be a constant trust. Can't be wishy-washy, in and out, in and out. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, James says. We've got a lot of people like that. They don't know which way is left or right. Well, God led me here. Two weeks later, God led me away. God led me, to, God led me here to come and help, okay? Well, where can I help? So you tell them, well, well, well that, that's, not what, that's not what I had in mind. Come on now. When God tells us to do something or asks us to do something and we feel a prompting of Him to come and help, then that, that could mean anything. But you see, it may not be to what we want or what we think it should be. So then all of a sudden, well, God's leading us elsewhere. <laughs> Folks, that's a double-minded mind and is unstable in all ways. Some come in and say, well, pastor, what's the church going to do for me? What's the church got to offer me? Well, we can offer you the Word of God. We can offer you biblical godly teaching and counseling from the Scripture. We can offer you teaching and discipling in the Word of God. I mean, is not God enough? Is the Word of God not enough? That you have to have everything else? You know, the church today, the average person is drifting further and further away from the church and the things of God and the Word of God because this is no longer satisfying them. You know, we want thrills and thrills and thrills and thrills and more thrills. And ballerinas and belly dancers and smoke and pyro and all that stuff. And more and more entertainment. This isn't entertaining enough. God's word isn't it exciting enough anymore. Well, just what the scripture says is going to happen in the last days. But we got to have a constant trust. Now, as we talk about David's constant trust here, uh, some wonderful things I want us to see and look at that. First of all, we need to trust him patiently. All right, very quickly, you need to trust God patiently. That's where we all mess up a lot of times, see? Because we live in a world today that everything's instant. Everybody cooks by microwave now. You know, 30 seconds, boop, done. And it tastes like it. I mean, instant everything. If it's not done in 30 seconds or less, forget it. If God doesn't move at your command or your wish, well, forget it. Folks, God's not a puppet on a string, and we don't tell God what to do, when to do, or how to do it. God moves in His own time, in His own way, when He wants to, whether you and I like it or not. So just because God didn't move all of a sudden, that doesn't mean I'm not going to have a constant trust, that I'm not going to keep trusting God because things didn't happen or move the way I wanted or like it. Look what David says there in the verse, right off the bat. He says, my, truly my soul waiteth upon the Lord, upon God. Okay, you're going to have to wait. A constant trust is patiently waiting. And keep in mind all the time, too, sometimes, uh, God's denial, and God's delay is not necessarily his denial. Okay, sometimes God delays things. So are you going to have a constant trust and continue to trust God because it didn't happen overnight? Patience. We're going to have to have a patiently trust if it's going to be constant. Look what Philippians 1 6 says. Being confident, being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, I can get discouraged a lot of times in the ministry and the pastoring and everything else, but I have to keep my thoughts in mind all the time. God began to work in me, and regardless of what happens or what goes on, God is going to perform it until the day Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. And you know what? I have to have a constant trust in that and to believe God that that's going to happen. Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is thy refuge. That's what David just told us. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. CJ, God's holding you up. He's got his arms under you. Many times as the scripture says we're withheld or we're being held up or hold up by the right hand of God. But you got to wait patiently. 
You see, when God told a man to let go of the branch, guess what? His arms was under him to catch him. But you see, we're afraid God's not going to catch us. So then we start trying to figure it out. How are we going to do it? How are we going to work it out? God's not moving. Didn't happen last night. You know, the beanstalk didn't grow up overnight, and the pot of gold's not up there, and I got to climb it and, you know, jacking a beanstalk. No, we ought to trust patience. No, with self. Here's another one. I love this one. Look at verse 5 of this text. This is fantastic. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. You've got to trust expectantly in 2024. Folks, are you expecting anything from God? Or do you live with no expectation at all? How many of you are expecting anything from God for 2024? For God to do something in your life, to work something out, to answer a prayer, or whatever it may be, are you expecting something from God? Or have you already given up on it because it didn't happen in 2023? Expect something from the Lord. Live in expectation of your God. Trust in Him with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all of your ways, and He will direct your path. And if that path means letting go of the branch, let go of it. You'll fall into the arms of Jesus. Can't get any better than that. Well, I don't think so, so i got to put a net down there. See, we already start trying to figure out how to build a net. No. Expect it. Listen to what Jeremiah says. I love this verse in Jeremiah 29, 11. This is God talking to you and I. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Aren't you glad that God has thoughts towards you this morning? God's got thoughts towards you. You young people, God's got thoughts towards you. Saith the Lord. Look at these thoughts. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, and to give you an expected end. God has an expected end for every one of us here. So I'm expecting something from the Lord. Amen. I thought, hey, what happens if Cox doesn't work out? They don't ever get this thing straightened out. Not a problem. I'll be down at Superfan of 55, sitting down with Brother Bowers and say, hey, I've got a little extra funds here. Is there any way we can get on this thing another day, another time? Let's talk. Believe it or not, I expect some big things from the Lord in 2024. Matter of fact, one of my big expectations is that God puts us, puts us on every day on Super Channel 55. That we can cover all of Central Florida, part of the South part. Of, we're already in, in Tallahassee. We're in Jacksonville right now, not just Central Florida. Over in 10,000 homes, broadcasting in over 15 different stations and channels and cables. We're not just on 55, folks. We're on over 15 different channels. The Super Channel broadcast is on. I'm expecting God to do some great things. If you don't expect nothing, then you're not going to get nothing. you got to trust God for this expectation that God has an expected end for you and your life as an individual. So if I'm going to have this constant trust, this place my confidence in, uh, to be whole or to be secure in, I've got to do it at all times. I've got to trust it patiently. I need to trust it expect, expect, expectantly. All right. And then secondly here, not only trust at all time, but trust in all things. Trust in all things. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we just quoted it to you. Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You got a 2024 church, you're going to have to trust God in all all things. All things. And I don't know how many of the all things are coming. But each person's life, family, and so forth will be said different than each other's. There will be some that will affect us all. But we got to trust God in all things, especially when the culture changes. Amen. Folks, get ready for some big changes. More than ever. More than ever. My, my, I was reading some more yesterday. I won't go over them now, but it's unbelievable what the Lord is changing. Mm, mm, mm. My, my, my. You're going to have to trust in all things when the culture changes. You're going to have to trust in all things when you feel uncertain. 
How many times do you ever feel uncertain about something? Anybody in here like that? Yeah. And we're living in uncertain times. We're living in dark days and darkness. We don't know for one thing next what's going to happen. Amen? But guess what? I'm going to have to trust God in all things. Even when I feel uncertain. See, don't go by feelings. Go by the Word of God. Your feelings will let you up and down. They're like a yo-yo. Your feelings and emotions go up and down, up and down. But the Word of God abideth and liveth forever. The Word of God never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. You've got to trust God. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29, 31. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farling? And one of them shall not f- fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered? Now, for some of you, it's not too much of a challenge for the Lord. For some of us, it's a quite of a challenge. Amen. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are all more value than many sparrows. You're of such value, God has every hair numbered on your head. That's how much God cares for you. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. I sing because I'm happy. Amen. Amen. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. Trust him. So we have, to tr- we have to have this confidence, trust. We need to trust at all times. Trust patiently, trust expectantly, trust in all things when the culture changes and when you feel uncertain about things. Number two, we've got to have a complete trust. Not just a confident trust, but a complete trust. Look at verse 8 again. Trust in Him at all times. Now you wonder where we get this in your outlines and stuff. We get them right out of the Scripture. You just take the verses and go down through it and digest it a little bit and, you know, write out some things, one, two, three, four, and, you know, what kind of things. That kind of helps you out. All right, a complete trust. Someone quoted, the mind cannot be at the same time full of God and full of fear. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Can't occupy the two. So this complete trust in verse 8. Look at it. What we could say here, first of all, I want you to see A there in your outline. An empty in trust. What do you mean an empty in trust? Empty. See, we might say an empty in trust when it's talking about a complete trust here. Look at verse 8 again with me. Here's what I'm talking about. Verse 8. Anybody see it there? It's the very next phrase. Well, besides you people. Pour out your heart before Him. See, if you're going to have a complete trust, church, in God this year in 2024, you've got to pour out your whole heart. You've got to empty everything that's in your heart. You've got to pour it out to the Lord. That's what David was doing here in Psalm 62. And, of course, many other psalms that David wrote were about the trials and the battles and everything he was going through, everything that was against him, the enemies and the whole nine yard. David was always coming before the Lord in a complete trust, and he was pouring out his heart to the Lord. When's the last time you've poured out your heart to the Lord? I mean, you just sat there in your chair at home or laying on the floor of the bed, driving in your car, and you just poured out your heart. Empty out your heart. Everything. Waiting times are not wasting times. We go back to that patiently. Waiting times are not wasting times. God can learn a lot of lessons and teach us a lot in the waiting time. Now we want to try to figure it out and get through it and do this and work this out, work that out, rather than trusting completely in the Lord, resting in Him, waiting on God, and then eventually it comes out and we see, man, that waiting time was worth it all. Worth it all. It wasn't wasted after all. People got saved by it. People got changed by it. People got affected by it. People, you know, it wasn't, so it wasn't wasted. Empty out your heart, church. Now that's sometimes going to take a little bit more than now I lay me down to sleep. My soul, I pray the Lord will keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Huh? 
Well, God, I'm going through a little trouble here today, but anyway, hey, but I got to get going because I got something here I got to go down. So thanks, amen. Here we go. Off we go. When's the last time you, you and I got alone with God and just poured out our heart over a matter, an issue, a loved one, a family member, a crisis? Well, Lord, remember, okay, God bless, amen. Here we go, jump in the car, we take off. When's the last time? This is what David says here, or King Solomon says in Proverbs one twenty three. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. King Solomon, David's son, says, I'm going to pour out my words. I'm going to pour out my spirit. I'm going to pour out my heart to you, God, in complete trust, in complete confidence. In a constant, at all times, in in all things. Pour your heart out. We might see a little bit more move of God. If we really pour our heart out. And I know many hearts are here today, maybe troubled, maybe broken, maybe sad. You may be glad. You're going through things. You don't understand everything. How long? Why? You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with questioning God. And asking God, Lord, why? But then be willing to listen to his response. And then when God gives you a response or an answer, then thank him for it. Well, I don't like that answer. That's not the answer I was looking for. You know, I mean, good night. I threw the bean out in the yard. The beanstalk grew. I jumped up, ran up there, but there wasn't no pot of gold. And now I'm fleeing for my life from the giant that's coming down after me. You see, facing the giants of life, we're going to face them. And you're going to need to have a confident trust and a complete trust in the Lord in 2024. You're going to have to learn to pull your heart out unto God. Psalms 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. How many of you ever prayed aloud? I mean loud. You want to pray aloud? Come out here at night and walk out here and go out in the ball field and just let it rip. Let the stars, the moon, the glory of God shine in, His creation. Just praise God, talk to God. Get out in your own backyard. Cry out to the Lord. Get in your car, close the windows. Turn the air conditioner on. Cry out to the Lord. Oh, my. I'm telling you. He cried out to the Lord, did he not? And he shall hear my voice. You know why the psalmist could say that? Because he had a confident trust, and he had a complete trust in God that God would hear him. See, we cry out sometimes, and we don't think God's listening. God, are you listening? Are you there? Or is there someone else up there that can help me? Jeremiah chapter 17. I love Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Hello? Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. But then Jeremiah comes back in verse 7. Now there's the, here's the contrast. Here's the difference between the man that, uh, that trusts in man and puts his flesh in man in his arm. Okay, here's the difference. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. And the Lord is, for he shall be a tree planted by the waters, and it spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful, uh, not to be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. That's the blessed man that trusts in the Lord. There's the one that trusteth in man, doesn't sound too good, does it? Trust in the Lord. Well, we gotta have this empty in trust in this complete trust, then there must be an earnest trust. 
earnest. We got to get real with God. We got to be real with God. We got to keep it real with God. We got to stay real with God. You might as well because He knows it. He sees it all, He hears it all. He's got x ray vision, He can see under the carpet. Amen. He even knows the secrets in your heart and your mind. Can't hide anything. So you might as well get real with God. Be real. Stay real. Don't get this wishy-washy trust. You trust today, but not tomorrow. You trust God in a little problem, but I can't trust God in a big problem, David. Because after all, I've got to help God out. You know, because I have some wisdom and I have some abilities and some skills. And so, you know, God just needs my help in this situation to, to, to figure this out, work it out. You know what? We find ourselves in a bigger mess. We got to get to a place where we just simply trust God. Now, that doesn't mean we have blind faith. It doesn't mean we're to be stupid about everything. God gives us a brain and wisdom, wisdom and expects us to use it to reason. Come now, then, saith the Lord. Let us reason, saith the Lord, together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as snow. See, we can reason with God. But we need to have an earnest trust. Look how earnest David was in this psalm. Search me, O God. When's the last time anyone in here, don't raise your hand or say alien or hallelujah. When's the last time you got honest before God? And you said, Lord, search me. Oh, God, know my heart. Try me. Here we go. Know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. In that psalm, David had an earnest trust. He was getting real with God. So you got to get real, and you got to be real with the Lord. And in this earnest trust, one must be sincere with God. That's what David was doing in this psalm. He was being sincere with God. He was also being repentant with God. Be real. Keep it real. And then not only is there an empty in trust, an earnest trust, but an engaging trust. you got to engage in this trust with the Lord. Well, I want to share three ways with you how to engage in trust. And I go to one of my favorite psalms in all the psalms. Psalms 37, one of my favorite ones. Trust in the Lord and do good. Now, if you trust in the Lord and do good, what's the results? You shall dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. There's the promise. Now, here we go. Here's three ways to engage in trust. Delight. Delight thyself also in the Lord. When's the last time you've just simply delighted in the Lord? Some of you got it motivated yesterday at the party because one of our ladies got a wonderful gift and uh, I quite had to figure it out there for a minute because she was showing it up and she had these nice big chocolate bars and they were giving the name out to them and everybody, the crowd was going, ooh, ah. And I said, oh, that must be some pretty fancy chocolate. Just guessing, you know, I didn't know. But yes, it was. How was it, Andy? She's not sharing it. But you see, Andy was smart yesterday. Because she went to get a gift when she got her number called out. She started picking some up. I go, no, you don't want that one. And she said, no. And she, so she goes to get something else. And somebody, she starts to walk. I said, no, you don't want that one. She said, well, I have to obey my pastor. I said, no, you don't want that one. I said, you want the, the other one around, the big one over there. Take that one. Said, That's the one you want. She goes, okay. So she, comes, she starts to walk from the table. And she goes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, you see? Santa Claus knows what's in the box. Amen? How'd you enjoy that? Did you like that? I thought you would. Who? Oh, your puppy. Don't let him tear it up, man. By the way, again, all four of you that received those beautiful bears and dogs, stuffed soft, fluffy animals, again, and the, and the neck thing and the bracelet, those are all a compliment from uh, St. Jude's Children's Hospital, Cancer Hospital. And compliments for they came through K Jewelers. So I hope you enjoyed those for the children of the cancer ward of St. Jude's Hospital. Praise the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. 
Now, folks, you've got to delight in it. Andy's going to have to delight in that chocolate. And I know she is because I understand that's some really high-class stuff. You know, I, I should have got it from her, but I didn't. I just, you know, I didn't want to take her thing from her. You know, so delight in that ch- chocolate. Delight in the Lord. What's the result? He gives you the desires of your heart. Now, wait a minute, folks. Don't get your desires of your heart on a selfish motive and greed and everything for you. Have your desires of your heart ought to be the desires of the Lord's heart. See, when you have the desires of your heart of the Lord's heart, God doesn't have a problem with giving you those desires because that's what he wants you to have. Then the second thing, if you're going to engage in trust, you've got to commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also uh, in Him, and what's the result? He shall bring it to pass. So three ways to engage in trust. Delight in the Lord, commit unto the Lord, and 2 Timothy 3, 12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then the third one, I don't know if you see this or not, in verse 6, And He shall bring forth the righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noon day. The third way to engage in trust is shine for God. Be that light. That, that, let your righteousness be as a light unto the Lord. It's the way you can engage in trust. Amen. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, first of all, I've got to have a constant trust. I've got to trust at all times. I've got to trust patiently, expectantly. I've got to trust in all things, even when the culture changes. And when I feel uncertain, then I need to have this complete trust. I need to empty out, pour out my heart unto the Lord. Then then I've got to have this uh, earnest trust, this sincere, repentant, and engaging trust. And that leads us thirdly this morning, a confident trust. A confident trust with God. Look at verse 8 again with me. Most of all, this comes out of verse 8, as David closed out his psalm there. Trust in Him. Okay, that's the first thing. When? At all times. Who? You people. What do I do? Pour out your heart before Him. See, now look at the confidence David has in this. Even though Absalom is after his life, he's trying to kill him, he's trying to overthrow the kingdom, cause havoc in the nation of Israel, and everything. A a revolt, a, a, a riot, a revolt against the kingdom. Kill his own father. Take over the kingdom. Throw him out. David comes with all of that. He says, God is a refuge for us. Selah. A confident trust. God is a refuge refuge for you this morning. No matter what you're going through, what's going to happen in 2024? I don't want you to lose this outline. I want you to put it on your refrigerator, keep it in your Bible, and when next year starts rolling around and all these things start, you've got to get this out and go through it because you're going to have to remind yourself because you're going to forget by tonight. That's just human, okay? God is our refuge. Hey there, He is our refuge. That's when you have a confidence trust. How do I know He's right? Because He is our shelter. God is your shelter this morning. Like I said a little while ago earlier, there's nothing better than to be in the very center of God's will. Let's just to be in His presence. Being in the center of God's will. He's our refuge. He's our shelter. Psalm 61, 2. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Let God be your rock. It's higher than anything you'll face. Higher than anything you'll go through. Anything you'll face, God is your refuge. He's your shelter. Psalm 91, and I love this psalm. Read it many times. One through six. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor the arrow that flieth by day nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. 
Do you know there are two of those things David talked about tonight? Because that's usually when everything happens the most. That's when we get depressed the most. That's when we get down the most. That's when things seem to bother us the most. That things when things when seem to be more fearful and so forth is in the night. It's not in the daytime when the sun is shining and bright like yesterday and today. It's in the night. It's in the night when you're sleeping when the demons want to come and bother you. Hello. It's in the night when the problems pop up in your mind. It's in the night when you wake up from a dream and half scared to death. Anybody had a few of them? It's in the night when your dreams keep you up. And you wake up, what was that? I mean, what, I don't know, what happened? I don't know, just, you know, and you share it with each other, whatever. It's in the night. It doesn't happen in the day when you're up and going about. No, it happens in the night. But the psalmist says, no, no, no. Here's what's going to happen in the night. <laughs> I love it. You're going to trust in him. He's your shield. He's your buckler. You don't need to be afraid by the terror at night or the arrow that flieth by the night or the day or the pestilence that walketh in darkness. He's your refuge. He's your shelter. And then a lot of times in all of that, how many times do we think, man, I could just, if I could just get some rest. Sometimes I see some of you come in here and you see me as well. Our eyes are bogging, bogging. They say, man, they didn't look like pastor didn't get much rest last night. And you're probably right. Looks like so-and-so didn't get much rest last night. And some of you we can tell because you're, ang- you're, you're cranky. Come on now, let's be smiling. And happy. Huh? How many of you get cranky when you haven't had enough rest? Now I'll raise my hand. You're irritable. How many get irritable when you don't have enough rest? Yeah. It happens, doesn't it? Take this psalm to heart and this whole message. See, when those times come, you've got to trust in God. You've got to trust in Him in, in all things, at all times. Even, David says, in the night. Because it's when the night when the enemy does his work under the cover of darkness. You see. Oh, you see. Well, when all that's said and done, here you go. He is not only our refuge, not only our shelter, he is our rest. Psalm 37, 7 and 8 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Well, there's that waiting, there's that patience. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Right back to the very beginning again. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Jeremiah 6.16 Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where, the, where, uh, where is the good way? See, everybody talks about the old paths and the old ways. I like them because the Scripture says they're good. Let's read it again so you understand this. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk. Therein. That was the nation of Israel. Oh, my friend, you need to rest in the Lord. He's going to give you rest, okay? I got to move for this quickly. His word is our resource. See, confident trust. He's our refuge. His word is our resource. His word is our position. 2 Timothy 3:16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Can somebody say amen to that? All Scripture, and it is what? It's profitable for the first thing, number one on the list, doctrine. People don't want doctrine anymore. They're fleeing the churches where they don't get doctrine. They don't hear doctrine. They don't teach doctrine. They don't preach doctrine. But see, the old ways and the old paths, they do. And the Lord says, walk in them. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God, the woman of God, the young person of God may be perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's our position. See, he's our resource. God is our resource, and our position is in the Word. 
It's in the Word, church. That's why we preach and teach the Word here, the Logos. That's why every service is from the Word. That's why all the Scriptures is from the Word. The Word is our power. Talking about our resource, it's our power. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the spirit and the sword of the Lord, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You see, our position, our resource and position is the word. The power is in the word. Psalms 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalms 119, 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. <coughs> Romans 10, uh, 10, 17. So faith, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. That's our resource. And trusting God. And when you trust God at all times and in all things, what are you going to trust? His Word. This is what we trust, church. The Word. It's the Word. That's why we use the Word here. That's why we preach and teach out of the Word here. It's thus saith the Lord. That's why we do verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by word sometimes. Subject, topic, it doesn't matter. Expositional, expository, preaching and teaching, sometimes a little exergesis. Depends on how serious we're going to get. By the way, we're going to be starting some new series coming up. Sunday night, Romans. Get ready. Buckle your seatbelts. One of the finest books written in the New Testament. Paul's, uh, Paul, that, that was Paul's, uh, that was, that was the, the greatest of his work. That was the masterpiece of Paul's work was Romans. Now we've looked at it before, but this time we're going to look at it a little more carefully. A little more seriously on Sunday nights. Wednesday night, we're going to be looking at holy living. Living a holy life in an unholy world. And we're going through the book of Ephesians. Verse by verse, Wednesday night. That's what we call Wednesday night in the Word. So don't miss out on this stuff. It's going to be some great Bible teaching. Okay? And on Sunday morning, most likely... Depends. I got one that's about seven weeks. The other one is a ten-week one. One is we're going to try to answer the questions. Are we living in the last days? And if they are, what are the signs of that? And the other is, is what we said before, the Ten Commandments. Honoring, obeying, and living and keeping God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. Got some good stuff God's got lined up for us. You're going to miss it if you're not here. All right? So let's see. That's why the apostle, I love it in Romans. Listen to what Paul says and we're done. We've got to go. Time's up. Romans chapter 4, verses 19 through 20. In closing. And being not weak in faith. All right, this is Paul writing to the church of Rome, to the believer. Let's not be weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. You know who he's talking about? Abraham. This is who Paul's writing about. Abraham, father of faith. Here he is. He wasn't weak in the faith. Let's not be weak in the faith, church, in the days ahead. Amen? we got to trust in him. His own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, uh, and neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now look at verse 20. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through un belief we got to quit staggering at the promises of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness Abraham at the age of 100 God had promised him a son Amen. through the line and the lineage that it was all come. And now he's 100 years of age. But he still, he didn't stagger with his faith. He believed God. Sarah being 90, both of them well past their time of having childbirth and giving birth. 
And yet just think about it. He didn't stagger with his faith. He believed God. And Sarah got pregnant at 90 years of age. And he was 100. And then God puts him through the test. Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, and go up to Mount Moriah and offer him there a sacrifice on the burnt offering. And he staggered not with his faith in God. He got Isaac. He got the donkey. He got the wood. He got everything. He started to climb up Mount Moriah and on the way, Isaac, and they get there and he takes Isaac. He puts him on the altar. Isaac says, I love the obedience of Isaac too. Father, where's the sacrifice? He takes out the knife. He pulls out the knife. Why? He staggered not with his faith with God. He believed God. He believed him so much that if he took his son's life, God would resurrect Isaac because God made a covenant promise with Abraham. And down he comes and God says, hold it. Good enough. I've seen thy faith. You have held not back your son, your only son. Turn around because in the thicket there's a ram. And there's the sacrifice. I love the obedience of Isaac. I love the obedience of Abraham. We stagger too much in our faith and trust in God. And God hasn't asked us to sacrifice our sons or our daughters. But he does ask us to present in our bodies a living sacrifice, which is holy unto God, reasonable, our reasonable service. Amen. Amen. God doesn't want a dead sacrifice. He wants a living one. And God wants us to trust Him more than ever in these days ahead. 2024, fasten your seatbelts. Man, there's stuff, it's it's unreal. And we're going to see things happen, I think, and come down. And you know what? We're going to start questioning. And we're going to come back to this service right here. And we're going to try to remember what God taught us in this message. That we got to trust God in all things, at all times. got to be a constant trust. Right? It's got to be a complete trust. It's got to be a confidence trust. Amen? Now we're going to have the Lord's Supper. Now let's have an invitation very quick here, right quick. It's just straight up 12 even right now. Okay, we're done. We trust it's been a blessing to those that have been listening and watching because things are coming. And we're going to have to trust God. And if we were all honest today, we all have a little struggle with that at times, don't we? Absolutely. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, see, she's honest about things. That's what it takes, see? That's, that's, that's being earnest. She's being real with God. But we're going to give an invitation right quick. For any that are here, recommitment to Christ this year is going to recommit your lives to trusting Him more than ever. To trust Him at all times and in all things. Even when things don't look right, seem right, sound right. Even when you've fallen off the cliff. But aren't you glad God provided a branch for the guy to grab onto? Amen. Yeah. Then he cried out for help, CJ, and God answered. And like most of us, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Let go. Let go and let God have his way in your life, your family. And trust God with your kids, your family. Trust God with your job, your business, whatever, completely, fully. God will provide. God will take care of it. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Those that are watching by Rumble right now, if you've never received Christ, you've never trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, we'd like for you to do so right now. We'd like to give you that opportunity to say yes to Christ and come to know Him. We've talked a lot about faith and trust today. Well, that's exactly what you have to do. You've got to put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross of Calvary. 
that he came to this earth. He lived a sinless life, a perfect life. He went to the cross. He died. He was buried and rose again on the third day just for you. His blood will forgive you of all sin and cleanse you. He wants to give to you eternal life, everlasting life. But my friend, you've got to put your faith and trust in Him. In Him only. Not a religion, not anybody's faith, not a denomination, not a church or a person, except for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're willing to do that right now. We're going to ask you to pray with us and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior on this last day of 2023 New Year's Eve day so let me ask you to bow your heads with us wherever you're at wherever you're watching wherever you're listening I want you to pray with us if you would please it's not the prayer in itself that saves you those are words communicating with God what saves you is putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ so we're going to ask you to do that right now pray with me dear God that's right go ahead I confess with my mouth you are the Lord. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you, God, and I ask you to cleanse me and forgive me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And so right now by faith, trust, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my life and heart to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. I pray this simple little prayer in faith believing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.